Hi, everybody. Glad to have you back. This is podcast number 34 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we're going to look at King George's War. In my last podcast, we talked about the War of Jenkins' Ear between Spain and England, which started in 1739. In Europe, however, bigger events were in the works, and in 1744, a much bigger war began called the War of the Austrian Succession, known as King George's War in North America, because the English colonists liked to name their wars after their monarchs. So the War of Jenkins' Ear was merged into King George's War, which now involved France as an ally of Spain against England. With France in the war, the entire east coast of North America, from Nova Scotia to Florida, was now involved in the fighting. With nearly all of Europe embroiled in the war, King George's War was really part of a world war that saw fighting as far away as India. In this podcast, we will also take a look at a type of legalized piracy known as privateering and its use by England, France, and Spain. We'll also look at the Boston Impressment Riots, which occurred during the war as a result of British policies allowing the Navy to kidnap men and pressing them into the Navy. On the screen now is a map of North America showing the main areas of fighting from 1739 to 1748. Down in the Caribbean, you can see the main battle sites between the English and the Spanish that occurred during the War of Jenkins' Ear. We talked all about this in my last podcast, and we paid special attention to the English invasion of Florida in 1740 and the Spanish invasion of Georgia in 1742, both of which failed. The colonists were comfortable enough handling only Spain, but when the War of Jenkins' Ear merged with King George's War, France was now in the picture too, and the situation became more dangerous. There was now the real possibility of an invasion somewhere in the colonies, the lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania warned about this when he said, We have not now the slothful Spaniard only to deal with. The French are an active, enterprising enemy, and however quiet we are at present, or however secure we may think ourselves, it is not to be doubted but they are meditating a blow to be struck, where they think it may be done with the least danger and most advantage to themselves. On the map, the red and blue explosions show generally where the fighting occurred, both on land and on sea. It was a long coastline and vulnerable to raids on both isolated land targets and capturing British shipping. You can see on the map that just above Georgia, Spanish privateers raided North Carolina on two different occasions, including one raid on Brunswick in 1748. A little further north, Spanish and French privateers prowled the Virginia Capes, which is the entrance to the Chesapeake Bay, and they also prowled the Delaware River a little further north of that, capturing British merchant ships and terrorizing Philadelphia. And a small raiding party even landed in New Jersey at one point, not doing much good, but still the fact that they could raid a colony so far north frightened a lot of colonists. A little further north on the map, the blue explosions around Boston and further up into Nova Scotia, where Annapolis is, represent generally the locations of raids conducted by the French and their Indian allies on English towns and outposts. Safe in their bases along Lake Champlain, the French and Indians conducted raids against targets north of New York City, such as Schenectady and Saratoga, represented by the westernmost blue explosions on the map north of New York. Raids also occurred in frontier areas of Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. New Englanders responded by building more forts in frontier areas. This was all the traditional way in which the French and English fought in previous wars in North America. The French raided and the English colonists fell into a defensive posture. In podcast number 29, about King William's War, I talked about the way in which the French conducted these raids and their techniques for conducting wilderness warfare in general. It was a little bit savage, but all in all a very interesting part of the picture and very interesting uh, listening as well. The English had powerful Indian allies. They were nominally allied with the Iroquois Confederation, especially the Mohawk Indians. And the English did make some efforts to reach out to them and get them into the war, but they didn't really do as much as they could have. And I think in some ways, had they done more to court the Indians, the Iroquois, to get them more involved in the war and to show them a little better faith, I think they could have stopped a lot of the raiding the French and the Indians were doing. And they probably could have also maybe put the French in a defensive posture. I've often said, and I still do, that the Iroquois were probably the most mismanaged and underutilized resource the English colonists had in dealing with the French and their Indian allies. I mentioned the traditional pattern of war between the French and the English in North America, which was that the French conducted raids from Canada and the English built forts and went on the defensive. There's another element to this tradition. During the colonial wars, the English liked to plan large military campaigns against the French in Canada, and King George's War was no different. During King George's War, the English planned two big campaigns against the French in Canada. 
One was against Quebec, which never actually happened. And the second big campaign was against the major French fortress at Louisbourg, which was a big success. On the right side of the map, you can see Louisbourg as indicated by a red explosion. I use a red explosion because it was an English victory. Near it is the town of Canso, which the French captured from the English. It was a fishing town. The French then imprisoned the English captives from Canso in nearby Louisbourg Fortress. When the English captives were finally released, they related what bad shape the fortress was in. Based on these reports, the governor of Massachusetts, William Shirley, one of Massachusetts' better governors, organized an expedition to seize Louisbourg. Louisbourg was a huge fortress. The French spent an enormous amount of money building the fortress. In fact, they spent many times more than the entire annual budget of New France. It had thick stone walls and plenty of heavy cannons. It was one of the most powerful fortresses in all of North America. As you can see on the map, Louisbourg was in a very strategic location. From here, the French could control the lucrative fishing villages and towns that dotted the coastline. It also put the French in a position to menace New England, and it was a haven of French privateering. To capture Louisbourg, the English assembled a force of 4,200 New England militia, which included a couple of companies of Indian rangers, which were some of the most reliable and best troops they sent, and about 90 ships. There was almost a certain religious crusader-like fervor that went along with some of these campaigns against the French. As I mentioned earlier, the French and the Spanish were Catholic, and they viewed the English as, her as heretics. And on the other hand, the English looked at the Catholics as followers of the Pope, and they identified the Pope as the Antichrist that was identified in the Book of Revelations. They also referred to the Catholic Church sometimes as the whore. That is the symbol that's used in the Book of Revelations for the church that the Antichrist would set up. One Puritan minister told his congregation, saying, And how sweet and pleasant it will be to pull down that stronghold of Satan. He was talking about Louisburg. And another preacher urged the New England men to destroy proud Antichrist and quite consume the French whore. Not everyone was certain that the campaign against Louisburg would be successful. In fact, Ben Franklin, writing to his brother in Boston, said, Fortified towns are hard nuts to crack, and your teeth are not accustomed to it. Taking strong places is a particular trade which you have taken up without serving an apprenticeship to it. On the screen now is a map of Louisburg and the area around it. As soon as the English ships were sighted, the French people in the countryside began fleeing into the fortress for safety. And at the bottom of the screen, the big red arrow shows where the English landed, and you can see how nearby they set up their camp next to a river. The men were very happy to be off the ships. One man wrote that the, that the ship rolled and pitched malevolently and stank abominably. And as is the case, as we've discussed this many times, any time you had an army on foot, you had disease following it. By the time the English landed, they already had a lot of men that were sick or ill. After landing, the, the English got to work pretty quickly. They sent out raiding parties to scour the nearby countryside, raiding towns and local villages, and the local Indians helped the French fend off some of these attacks. The fortress of Louisbourg was very strong uh, against sea attack, but it was not very strong against land attack. In fact, its west side was somewhat weak and open, and the English immediately began preparing siege works, dig digging trenches and setting up cannons that they could lob into the city. They also set up several cannon batteries into the hills to the west. You can see these marked on the maps, because from there they could shell the city as well. And the English quickly overtook a French battery that on the map is noted as the Grand Battery. This battery had a number of cannons bigger than the ones that the English had, so they were a great service to the English. The French should have blown up this fort, but they didn't when they abandoned it. Off to the north and east of Louisbourg, there are several small islands out in the channel, and the French built a fort with a lot of cannons on it on one of these islands that I've called Battery Island, or Island Battery. I think I got that backwards. There was really no way to effectively control Louisbourg, even if you captured it, if this island battery could shell your town from there. So one night, the English, under cover of darkness, sent out several rowboats full of men to try and take over the island, but many of them were drunk, and they were so loud that the French detected them and were able to drive them off the island. It was a disaster. So what the English did is, if you'll notice on the map, just north of the island battery, there's a place called uh, Lighthouse Point. And from here, the British were able to set up some cannons so they could shell this, this island and the French eventually abandoned it, so the English captured it. The French tried to send supplies and reinforcements to the town by ship. These were captured by the English ships, and a relieving party of troops coming overland was also fended off, and at this point, uh, Louisbourg was doomed. And on June 28th, after a 47-day siege, Louisbourg surrendered. 
Over 9,000 cannonballs had been fired by the British at the fortress during the course of the siege, and the English lost only about 100 men. It was a stunning success. One of the ironies is, is that after the English occupied Louisbourg, they actually lost more men to disease than they had uh, actually attacking the fortress itself. One clever thing the English did after they captured the fort, they kept the French flag flying over Louisbourg. This tricked French ships into thinking that Louisbourg hadn't been captured, so they would sail right in and the English would capture these ships, so it was kind of a clever trick. When news of this victory reached uh, New England, there was universal rejoicing. It was one of the greatest victories of the English in any of, the, any of their wars with the French in North America, certainly the greatest victory during the King George's War. I think the the English were lucky they had won. Had the, had the uh, fortress itself not been in such bad shape, I don't think they would have. Keep in mind that all of these troops the English sent up there were militia. These were not professional, regular soldiers. These were citizens who had guns. So it was kind of a stunning victory in that way. During times of war, it was common practice for European nations to authorize private ships to attack enemy shipping. This was called privateering, and it was basically legalized piracy. Governments liked privateering because it didn't cost them anything. It enriched their nation while destroying an enemy nation's ability to make war. And effectively, it made private ships an extension of their navy. So it kind of supplemented their navy with extra ships. The English were particularly good at privateering, and England's North American colonists were especially enthusiastic privateers. On the screen right now is a map of North America, and it shows at the top a red box, the very top red box, the privateers by nationality from 1739 to 1748. That would have been during the entire length of the War of Jenkins Ear and King George's War. The British produced 2,598 privateering ships, and about half of those were from the colonies, while Spain only produced 598, and France only produced about 546. So the British produced far more than both the Spanish and French combined. In the colonies, privateering attracted wealthy entrepreneurs who invested in privateering ships, expecting to make big returns on enemy ships captured by their ships. Some investors invested quite a bit of money in privateers, and even common crewmen could make a good amount of money by capturing just a couple of enemy merchant ships. And it really is a testament to the growth and strength of the colonies, I think, that they could produce so many privateers, as many as France and Spain combined, just from the colonies. And the colonies weren't even an independent nation yet. All right, if you take a look at the map on the screen right now, too, you can see how many privateers were based in each of the main cities in the colonies. For example, Boston had 60 privateers based there. Newport had 194 privateering ships based there. New York City had 230. Philadelphia had 64. One of the reasons Philadelphia had a problem is that so many Quakers lived there. Quakers were pacifists. They didn't want to use money or spend money on things like privateering or defenses. Otherwise, Philadelphia would, I think, had a lot more privateering ships. And lastly, Charleston down south in, in South Carolina had 29 ships based there. So really, Newport, Rhode Island and New York City were the two big bases for colonial privateering. For the Spanish, Havana in Cuba and St. Augustine in Florida were the two main privateering bases because they were in the right area to attack shipping. After having lost Louisbourg, the French were in a difficult situation. They couldn't really do the kind of privateering that they wanted to in North America. They didn't really have a good base to base their privateers out of. The most common type of ship used for privateering was the sloop. This is a ship that carried between 10 and 18 guns, usually had a crew of 60 to 80 men. They were fast and light, and they were maneuverable, especially in shallow water. They could go far into rivers for a ways if it was a big enough river or inlet, so they could escape bigger ships like frigates or other ships. If you look carefully at the map, you'll see that I've shaded some of the areas in the Caribbean in yellow. These are the sea lanes where the richest cargo ships went, and by far most of the privateering happened down in the Caribbean. There was some off the coast of North America, but by far the richest prizes were to be had down in the Caribbean because of the merchandise they carried. Things like sugar, cocoa, coffee, molasses, and indigo. These were all very rich types of commodities that brought a lot of money. Most of the privateering in the Caribbean revolved around the cycle of the seasons. You didn't want to be out there in the hurricane season, which occurred from July through mid-October. So much of the attacks and privateering that went on in the Caribbean happened in the cooler months, fall and winter. In North America, the situation was exact opposite. 
you want to do attack in warmer months. Privateering could make a lot of money for ship owners and entrepreneurs who had invested in them, and also for the crewmen that captured enemy ships. They got a cut of the pay as well, but it was not without its consequences. Privateering greatly increased the costs of goods, and insurance rates went up quite a bit on shipping, which also further increased the costs of goods. The shipping of all nations suffered to a degree, France especially. France lost almost 30% of its annual trade just to privateers. There was a certain irony in the fact that certain British insurance companies were actually insuring French ships and Parliament had to step in and put an end to that. One of the problems with privateering is that it siphoned men off from the Navy. Uh, men were paid so much less in the, in the Navy and the conditions were cruel. So when they could, they would desert and go join privateering ships because they could make so much more money. It also affected the Colonial Coast Guard in the same way. Whenever these guys on these Coast Guard ships could, they would skip ship and go join a privateering crew. In fact, desertion rates were so high that one of the governors of Massachusetts actually issued a proclamation saying that no commander of any privateer or trading ship shall entertain any person till he hath by all reasonable ways endeavor to discover whether he hath deserted any ship of war, nor who he knows or is informed to be a deserter on pain of 20 pounds. There were constant complaints that the Navy wasn't doing enough to protect English shipping off the coast of North America, especially in the South and the Carolinas where most of it was occurring. In fact, one person wrote, we have had no king ships on a cruise for these 10 months past. So badly is this coast taken care of. But in fairness to the Navy, I don't think there's much the Navy really could have done. They couldn't be everywhere all at once. And the English suffered much less at privateering than did the French or the Spanish. And wars always affect people differently. Some people suffer in wars and other people make a lot of money from it. And that was certainly the case in King George's War. The Royal Navy was chronically undermanned throughout its history, and to try and remedy this, sometimes a ship's captain would sail up to a port, and he would round up a number of his men, his crewmen, arm them, and send them ashore, and they were allowed to kidnap people and literally force them into the Navy. So they would kidnap you if you just happened to be in the wrong place and bring you to the ship, and congratulations, you're now in the Navy. These were called press gangs, and they would impress people into the Navy against their will. This was a huge uh, hardship to the people that were impressed, as well as to their families. You may never see your father or brother or, or son again. There were laws in place by the time of King George's War that limited how impressment could be done, and there was actually a law passed during Queen Anne's War that prohibited the impressment of colonists into the Navy. Subsequent laws have been passed at this time that seemed to cast doubt on whether or not that was still the case, but it was kind of a shady area of law. So on November 17, 1747, Commodore Charles Knowles sailed into Boston with a squadron of ships. He was on his way down to the Caribbean, and he needed men for his ship. Some of them had deserted, probably to privateers. So he sent a press gang ashore, like he had done probably in other places, into Boston. And the press gang was rounding up kidnapping men and taking them back to the ship and telling them they were now part of the uh, Navy. Well, a mob formed in Boston, and these were pretty angry people. In fact, some of the accounts say it was as many as a 1,000 people. And the mob kidnapped some of Commodore Knowles' men and kind of held them as guarantee that Commodore would return the men he had kidnapped or pressed into the Navy. The governor of Massachusetts, William Shirley, made a good faith effort to try and defuse the situation. He was kind of stuck between a rock and a hard spot. On the one hand, he felt the duty to the king and to the king's navy to make sure it was staffed. But on the other hand, he was upset that they had gone about doing this press gang activity, kidnapping Bostonians and forcing them to be in the navy. Governor Shirley was also a little afraid of the mobs that were, that were forming outside of his house and downtown. He called out the militia to try and stop it, but the problem was that the mob was made up of the militia. One of the sheriffs arrested some of the rioters, but the rioters quickly grabbed some of the sheriff's deputies and held them also in exchange for the people that had been arrested. It didn't take long for Governor Shirley to realize the situation was dangerous, and he fled Boston to Castle William Island, which is just off the shore of Boston there for his own safety. This riot went on for three days, and Commodore Knowles actually turned his ships like he was going to bombard Boston with his ships. That's an amazing thing to think that that would happen. Governor Shirley intervened. He did talk to Knowles and kind of helped defuse the situation. Knowles ended up returning most of the captives, the men he had kidnapped, and uh, that kind of defused the situation. Knowles ended up suing someone that had written a libelous or slanderous newspaper thing about him in the newspaper, so it ended up in court as well. Now, while all this was going on, there was a young man in Boston, a man named Samuel Adams, 
who would become very famous. He almost single-handedly starts the War of Independence a few decades later. At this time, he was a young man. He had a newspaper called The Independent Advertiser, where he criticized the press gangs. He defended the mob for exercising, quote, the natural right which every man has to repel those mischiefs of the press gangs and by participating in the tumult. And that since the the people that were kidnapped did not have sufficient remedy, he argued that they, quote, have a natural right to defend themselves. And interestingly, Samuel Adams would go on to decry the violence in the mobs. And this is classic Samuel Adams. He would do this years later as the Revolutionary War was heating up. He would organize and plan mob activity and then go into the newspaper and decry the violence of it and then blame the British for it. King George's War ended in 1748. And as part of the negotiations and settlement with France, the English decided to return Louisbourg Fortress to the French in exchange for some territory that the French had conquered in India, which they returned to England. And this infuriated the colonists. They were angry that a government so far away could make decisions like this about things on their very doorstep. And I think it added to the growing separation and irritation that colonists felt towards English policy. In response to returning Louisbourg to the French, the English built the city of Halifax in Nova Scotia, which is today a large city there, to act as a counterbalance. There's a certain irony about the war, too. King George II, for whom King George's War was named by the colonies, he actually led troops personally into battle in Europe during the war, and he was the last English king to actually lead troops into battle. No English king since that time has led troops personally into battle. One consequence of the war, King George's War, was that the British officials in London decided to take the defense of the colonies a little more seriously, and the next war, which would be just a few years off, called the French and Indian War, would be a much bigger war than King George's War, and the British would commit serious resources to that war, much more so than they did to all the previous wars in North America combined. For further reading, I recommend the following books and articles. The Colonial Wars, 1689-1762, by Howard H. Peckham. The Struggle for a Continent, The Wars of Early America, by John Furling. American Colonies, The Settling of North America, by Alan Taylor. History of the Americas, The Colonial Americas, by John Francis Bannon. Predators and Prizes, American Privateering and Imperial Warfare, 1739-1748, to by Carl E. Swanson. King George's Army, 1740-1793, to by Stuart Reed. The War of Jenkins' Ear, The Forgotten Struggle for North and South America, 1739-1742, to by Robert Gowdy. And Commerce and Conflict, The Knowles Riot of 1747 and Transatlantic Opposition to Impressment, by Jonathan Feld, published in Penn History Review, Volume 24, Issue 2, Article 5, April 5, 2019.